And welcome into the uh, Charleston County Criminal Cor uh, Justice Coordinating Council's quarterly forum. Uh, my name is Brad Franco. I am the morning anchor at News 2. Uh, uh, so proud to be a part of this as it's a chance for our community to get to know more about the justice system in Charleston County, those involved in it on a regular basis, and what's being done to make sure uh, that our justice system works the way it's supposed to, and what is being done to make it even better than it can be. Uh, I want to begin by introducing those who will be a part of this forum today, those who will be uh, letting us know what they do and answering questions at the end. We begin with the new chairman of the uh, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, uh, Jason Bruder, with the Charleston Police Department. I also want to welcome in Sheriff Kristen Graziano. She is the uh, new Charleston County Sheriff. Solicitor Scarlett Wilson of the Ninth Circuit in South Carolina. Major Dorothy Harris is with the Alcannon Detention Center working there. Want to welcome the WellPath representatives, Latasha Foggy, Director of Nursing, Kellyanne Lee, the Administrator of Health Services, and Dr. Parag Dalsania, Medical Director. Uh, as we get things started here uh, this evening, I uh, just want you to know that we will be taking time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, as you engage with us here tonight, uh, feel free to put those down in the chat section of the Q&A section. And when we get to that point, uh, we will call on you or simply read your question if you'd rather uh, it go that way. Uh, we want to begin here uh, tonight with letting you know about what the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council is, why it exists. And for that, I want to welcome back in Chairman Bruder. Thanks, Brad. The CJCC for Charleston County was formed uh, back in 2015 as a collective of elected and senior officials, law enforcement, judicial and court leadership, behavioral health professionals, victim and legal advocates, and 12 community representatives, all who are committed to make, taking a hard look at our local criminal justice system. Our mission has been to assist with making sustainable data-driven improvements to Charleston County's criminal justice system and thereby improving public safety and community well-being. We focus on systems as a whole and utilize data and collaboration to focus on common challenges and forge agreed upon solutions. Upon our, our we're currently working on a three-year strategic plan founded in data and community priorities. Uh, we have a short video here that, that talks about some of the work we've done. Dina, we're not hearing the audio, so uh, I don't know if you have a chance, if you can go back, start it over again, maybe that'll help us here. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, We want to show you this because it's a, it's a good overview uh, for a lot of you. If you've never heard of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and you're trying to figure out what, what in the world this is all about, this short two-minute video really encapsulates all of the work uh, that has gone into what is being done, some of the initiatives uh, that have been put forth by the CJCC, and the goals moving forward. Uh, as uh, we're going to learn more about what, uh, what, what is going on with COVID-19 in our justice system. Obviously, it has had a huge impact. And uh, that, like everyone else, uh, uh, there has been huge adjustments that have had to be made. Uh, and that video uh, tells a lot about that. I don't know if we're going to be able to get that on. But uh, the bottom line here, um, Jason, is uh, that this council uh, has come together to make improvements in, this justice, in the justice system. And so far, uh, there have been huge steps that have been taken, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, we, we've, we've come a long way and there, there's certainly a long way to go. And one of the things that's always impressed me is how we all come together as a group for a, a common goal there and, and all work together. Um, you know, as noted, the, the CJCC is a collaborative council. We're guided by data, which is, which is really important to our success and it, and it hinges on us working together. Um, there are system actors and community members all, all working together. Um, we have the best opportunities for overcoming the longstanding and um, complex nature of the criminal justice system that we all face. So before we dive too far into our agenda here, I'd like to take a moment to uh, continue a relatively new tradition that we've started. Um, maybe, 
or maybe you ready, Adina? Still no sound there. Oh. There's 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 an audio issue, and um, as, as we have learned, uh, I have learned painfully in many cases, uh, the technology when you want it to work, it just simply doesn't always do what it's supposed to do. Um, we, you can always check out that video uh, on the CJCC's page. Uh, we'll also share that with you if you want to check that out uh, a little bit later on. Uh, it, it's definitely worth the two minutes because it gives you a good overview of exactly uh, what's going on and what, what what you'll learn more about what preceded tonight, uh, especially as we talk about uh, COVID-19. But before we get to that, uh, Jason, we'll toss it back to you because I know you have uh, something special you want to do here tonight. Yeah, Dina, you want to stop sharing screen? There we go. I'm going to make sure we get full caption in this one uh, reaction here. So uh, we're going to take a minute and honor someone from the community that's been doing some extraordinary things uh, and helping to improve the local criminal, ju criminal justice system and strengthen our community with the CJCC Community Justice Award. Tonight, there's someone very special we'd like to honor. This person embodies selflessness and service. Please join us in celebrating and supporting Lydia Cotton. I know we'd all probably give our standing ovation if we were all there in person, but we'll all give you a little virtual clap here. Uh, for those of you that haven't had the privilege of, of meeting Lydia before, I'll tell you a little bit about her. She was born in Puerto Rico into a family with 12 children and survived a life-changing cancerous brain tumor and stroke in 2003. Since recovering, Lydia has dedicated her life to serve as a voice and advocate for the Hispanic community here in Charleston. She responds to community needs 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Lydia serves not only as a well-known spokesperson on behalf of the Hispanic community, but also as a representative in the following roles. She's on the city of North Charleston, Hispanic liaison, a co-founder of Art Pot Nonprofit Group, the CJCC community representative for the Hispanic community, a city of Charleston Latina ambassador, a city of Charleston mayor's commission on homelessness and affordable housing, City of Charleston Commission on Women, North Charleston Housing Authority Commissioner, South Carolina Arts Commission for Berkeley County, and the Accessibility Board member. And she's the host for Aqui Estamos, hopefully I got that right, radio show. Uh, Lydia leads with her heart and her passion, and we are grateful for her helping and contributing to CJCC. Lydia, do you have any remarks? We greatly thank you for all the work you've done with CJCC. Thank you. We all respect the humility. I definitely receive it. I thank you so much. I, this is a body that I admire, that I learned from the last five years, that I observe so many hard work behind the scenes that we, the community, cannot comprehend. But at the same time, we want to know. So give us some time to, to understand it's difficult what you do. Uh, but I'm very humble and appreciative for the work that y'all do. And I want to congratulate our sheriff, uh, uh, Ms. Graziano. And I would like to also extend my gratitude to, to all of you and every man and woman that serve the community because what you all been told me is that the more the community look for to learn, the more we are going to find. And it's a good thing. Thank you. If I could just chime in for a minute, Lydia, um, I can't thank you enough for all that you do for us. And, and as a token of my office's appreciation, when we see you, hopefully we can get you one of our challenge coins. I can't, I don't know that yeah. I can get it on camera, but it has a state seal and it says, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. And you embody that. Um, in the world of politics, especially, I see a lot of people who talk the talk, but you really walk the walk and you are there at any point, at any time for us and for your community. And I just can't thank you enough for being an advocate to let people, especially in the Hispanic community know that when you cooperate with us, when you cooperate with the police, when you're a victim, when you're a witness that we're on your side and we're not out to get you. I think there's this false belief that working with us is going to mean 
deportation and it simply does it and has it in my experience and you've been a great voice for that and helping us um, have people to cooperate so that we can we can find justice so when I see you I'm going to get this coin to you and um, I thank you so much for all you do thank you so much I appreciate it very cool congratulations Lydia to you um, let's uh, talk about what happened last time uh, because uh, in our first quarterly forum, uh, which was held in October of last year, uh, we highlighted the CC, uh, CJCC's work uh, and how it defines the collaborative council and this, what they do in uh, studying trends, identifying common challenges and implementing strategies uh, in trying to address them. It focused on the front end of the justice system last time and the significant changes that our local criminal justice system uh, has gone through in the last couple of years. We dove into the effective efforts to divert and deflect individuals from entering or going deeper into the criminal justice system uh, where possible by going through a sense of strategies like uh, citing and releasing folks who didn't necessarily need to go to jail, uh, early access to services for those who are suffering from substance abuse, disorders, uh, mental illness, homelessness, the forum also discussed what happens after someone is booked into the jail, sharing insights into the legal process, bonding practices, release patterns, and pretrial outcomes, and making it to court, and staying out of trouble, as well as continuing challenges that require further improvement. All in all, these changes uh, have shifted jail use in Charleston County from primarily municipal and magistrate charges to the more serious charges and growing emphasis on public safety and achieving better outcomes. It was great, uh, learned a lot, and actually turned into a story that we broadcast uh, on News 2. If you wanna check it out, it's worth viewing. You can go to the CJCC's website. Uh, we'll put that link there in the chat box for you if you want to uh, look at it later. Uh, but we all know uh, 2020 was challenging to say the least and COVID was the, the primary reason for that. Uh, and it has had a major impact on the criminal justice system, just like anything else, as I mentioned earlier. So tonight we're going to talk about the impacts of COVID on the criminal justice system and how that's being navigated by the folks you see here on our screens tonight. So we want to start with what it's like in the Alcannon Detention Center, because uh, you have folks uh, going in and out of there on a regular basis. Uh, and that is where we will start with our conversation with the WellPath team and Major Harris, and we'll bring them back in. Uh, good evening to y'all. Just walk us through what it's like uh, at the Alcannon Detention Center on a daily basis, trying to navigate a pandemic and stop it from becoming an issue there. So thank you so much for that introduction. And we're happy to be here and share what it's like to be inside Alcannon Detention Center. Next slide. As you can see, COVID has drastically impacted our numbers here at the jail. They've declined steadily over the course of the last year. Next slide. Um, so, excuse me, sorry. Um, so we have been testing here in the jail since the very beginning of COVID. And however, since just October 1st, we have run over 1,100 COVID samples here just at the jail. This is for staff, patients, and officers at the jail, as well as outside law enforcement agency staff that we are testing. In that time frame, we have only had 116 positive samples. Next slide. So for prevention, identification, and treatment of COVID here, we do follow all CDC guidelines. We have implemented safety features to prevent COVID from entering as well as from spreading to the jail. For staff or patients that present with any signs and symptoms of COVID, we immediately isolate and promptly test the individual. We also test anyone that is at risk of any exposure, and we'll also isolate and test any high risk exposures. Next slide. We have a very collaborative relationship between medical, custody, and DHEC, which is our local health department, to successfully manage situations as they arise. Most recently, we had a total of 22 patients in three different units test positive over the course of five days. 
I honestly feel that due to our prompt isolation, quarantine, and testing, we were able to prevent this spread to our other roughly 800 patients. Next slide. Moving forward, the key is that we all must prevent uh, COVID. We need to not hesitate, we need to vaccinate. We need to make sure that we're wearing our masks and staying six feet apart, as you can see I'm standing away from Major Harris and you can hear me. We need to get tested and stay home when you're sick. We need to avoid large gatherings. We need to practice social distancing, get your vaccine when it's your phase. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Major Harris. Hi everyone. Um, I just, um, overall for us, when COVID initially hit, our um, average daily population was running about 1,300 inmates. And now we're running about 750, 760. So that has made a, a, a tremendous impact on the amount of people that we have in the jail. But also it's been a collaborative effort with the police agencies. They're mainly arresting people that have serious charges as opposed, as opposed to um, misdemeanors. So that has helped as well. Um, the impact that is, it has had on the inmates um, and the facility, we have gotten rid of some programs like AA and the GED program and some other programs for our female inmates um, and our um, chaplains too. But a lot of that has, is, uh, the contributing factor is that we have older people that come in and to reduce the risk of them getting sick or causing um, our inmates to become sick, um, we just decided that we would just try to see how it would go. But we're looking at coming back online with um, a lot of our programs. It's just going to determine, the determination will be how COVID, um, how well we do with um, uh, making sure that the inmates are safe within the facility. Um, I think that some of the lessons that we have learned is that no matter how much you plan, there's always going to be a change. <laughs> and as long as we can learn how to adapt and overcome, um, which we have done, um, I think that even when COVID hit, there was a consensus among the inmates thought that they had heard the story that all, um, all Black people were dying from COVID. And then once Kellyanne and the medical team came in and, and informed them that that was not the case and everything that they needed to do to make themselves um, safe. So we give them hand sanitizers in units. They all have masks to wear. The employees all wear masks when we're at work. So um, I think the, the, the best le lesson learned is just learning how to adapt and overcome and make sure that the inmates understand what's going on. All right, thank you all. I, I do have one quick question. It, is it, it, they're getting the, as soon as they get there, it's the rapid test that they go through or is it a, they have to wait for the longer test as well? So we actually do, um, when they arrive at the facility, we do screening questions to determine if they have any COVID symptoms or exposure. And we use the actual, the rapid Abbott machine, mm -hmm. which results within 15 minutes. And that's the same machine we're actually using at what we call the Sally board outside as well. Okay. Thank you all. Um, Solicitor Scarlett Wilson of the Ninth Circuit in Charleston County, uh, Sheriff Christian Graziano, both coming off uh, an election year, which is a grind. Uh, and congratulations to both of you, uh, Solicitor Wilson on a re-election and Sheriff Graziano on uh, winning as a Charleston County Sheriff. And you're, you're in different places as far as uh, Solicitor Wilson, your administration's in place. You have things that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and the sheriff is uh, basically starting from scratch uh, in a new administration. So it's a, it's a challenge in any year, let alone having to deal with the pandemic. So let's start with you, Solicitor Wilson. How is COVID impacting uh, what you guys are doing there in the, in the solicitor's office? Well, it has put the brakes on everything. Yeah. Uh, and as you can see by the slide that's up, uh, we have both Berkeley and Charleston County 
um, shown in these bar graphs and moving from left to right, it's showing the growth in the age of cases. So it's just the cases that are pending are getting older and older and older. Um, it's not as bad as it could be because Judge Dennis has worked really hard to see that we're having court on the cases that we can have court on virtually. But those tend to be the cases that are simpler and easier to move, that don't require a trial, um, that don't involve great exposure to prison time. Um, or on the other hand, we have moved a few where it was obvious to everyone involved, the defendant, the victims, the court, us, the defense attorneys, that the person was going to prison and there was no question about it. Uh, we've been able to move a few of those. But as you can see from the slide, the cases are getting older and older and older. We just received a new order last week suspending all in-person hearings except on an emergency basis. Uh, so we're going to be stuck for a while, but we're trying to make the best use of that time as we can. Um, and that has been been the challenge, really. Um, I think there are some highlights. I think that uh, technology, as in any industry or any business sector, we're learning new ways to do business. And I think long term, that's going to serve us well. It's going to serve us well if we were to have a natural disaster, floods, um, a hurricane, something like that. Now that we have been through this process of having court online, there are hearings that we can do online. There are also various meetings that we can have with the judge that we can do online. So um, while it is a challenge and we're gonna have a challenge when we come out working with the court, deciding which cases deserve priority, which cases should be trials, which cases um, really don't serve the community and which don't make good use of the court's resources or our resources. So that's been a challenge. Another challenge that people may not think about is just the administration of an office. And uh, I'm sure Sheriff Graziano is, is seeing some of this. You know, part of the way that people learn is on the job learning from their peers, learning from their coworker, learning from their legal assistants. You know, we have several new attorneys who haven't been able to go into a courtroom in person and who haven't had an office mate or a desk mate because we're still on a rotation. So um, the training aspect, the learning on the job aspect has been different. On the other hand, I've been able to capitalize on this time down and offer different types of training that we might not ordinarily be able to do because we're on that, that hamster wheel of court and prep. So we're trying to make the best of it. Sheriff Graziano, this is, uh, you, you're fresh on the job as a sheriff. You have to navigate a pandemic. Um, how do you do that? Well, you do it with, with a good plan and, and great staff. And I think that's what what's been happening you know uh one thing i'm so encouraged about just, i've been been on the job as you said for a week uh technically but i have been working with kellyanne and major harris at the jail for probably over two months because that was a, a, a problem that we identified going into it uh in fact in in december we had all the residents tested to as the numbers started to to increase uh, just in, a, in an effort to identify folks um, and then isolate them so that they didn't get better. So we've been ahead of the game a little bit, uh, but but as as you all, everyone was saying, you know, we're still learning from this, and and uh, you know, the CDC and and our protocols change. Almost, I think Kelly Ann sends me updates often, but they 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 change often, so we just have to adapt to that. Uh, we do have robust protocols for staff in effort to keep both the residents of the jail safe, as well as uh, our staff. And that is time consuming, it, but, it's, but it's necessary. It's necessary to have that data um, for statistical reasons so that we can do better. So I, I'm just encouraged by that. Um, this is just another one of those challenges. We're gonna have several down the road, but we're learning from this and, and, um, I, and I'm, I'm re really just encouraged by, by the staff and how they've handled it and how they've adapted to it. What, what are some of those things that you're looking at moving forward 
because uh, it, it appears the pandemic, it's going to be here for nobody knows how long. I mean, it, we're, we're going to have to navigate it in some way. Uh, general public maybe get vaccinated uh, by the end of the summer. So realistically, at least through this year, we're going to have this around. So is there long range plan? Do you long range plan for a pandemic? Well, yeah, I think you do. I think that's part of um, going forward. I think that's what you have to do. Solicitor Wilson was alluding to the cases not moving forward. Uh, one of the beauties about uh, with law enforcement is we can, it's particularly lower level cases, not, not the ones that she prosecutes, but the lower level ones, we can set those in advance, months out in advance. So uh, they don't move through the system as quickly as we'd like, but, we, but we're, not, we're also not um, clogging up the system and having to reset those cases. That, that's one of the things. I think this gives us, Brad, uh, frankly, a unique opportunity to expand on some opportunities that in training, because we're dealing now with more, uh, I would say extreme mental health cases both in the jail and on the street. And, and it really has given us an opportunity to look at some, some training initiatives uh, that it, w whether it's diffusing the escalation training um, to work with people, we, and I think it's necessary, but it's given us that opportunity and that, 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 uh, that lens through, through the eyes of, of the, what we're seeing now, because you know we don't have a, 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 syst a system set up so we can take people to directly to a mental health facility uh, like we used to with, with the center that we had. Um, and, that and you know, dovetailing on what the sheriff is saying, I think it's important to note and for the community to understand how much law enforcement has adapted, um, especially with regards to low level offenses and what, um, Christy Danford was speaking about um, earlier today, um, what we're seeing in the jail for the most part now uh, are maybe there'll be someone who's arrested on a lower level offense, but those people are being let to bond uh, more often. And the people who are staying in the jail, the people whose cases are aging are the people with more serious crimes. And that's what you, if you're gonna have people in jail, you want it to be the more serious cases and not low level cases that are, don't create a danger to the community. So that's happening. And But another thing that's happening before we even get to the jail is law enforcement. And it's not just the sheriff's office or the city police department, North Charleston is involved, Mount Pleasant is involved. All of our local law enforcement is involved in making the decision when they have the discretion and when community safety is not put at risk, we're not making that arrest in the first place. Now they may be given a citation for later or they may be doing some other deflection as the sheriff referred to. So um, the backlog that's building is, is largely made of cases that are absolutely necessary. And, and I think that moving forward as the sheriff said, it's going to give us an opportunity to look at what we call necessary as we move forward. Red, Changing Red. definition. You know what? Major what Harris, go ahead, Sheriff. Major Harris uh, had, had some programming has stopped at the jail as a, as a result of COVID. And we know that that is not going to end uh, anytime soon. So it's given us also an opportunity to revisit uh, the use of technology in these programs and bring it back because we really, we have to have it. We can't just stop doing it because people suffer as a result of that. So that's that's something that we're also revisiting. When you say programming, what do you mean? She was talking about the, the GED program. Oh, I got you, yeah, yeah. Programs, training programs, anything that would help people uh, stay busy mentally and, and, and be successful when they get out. And I think it's important for, for those of you who weren't with us uh, for the first, uh, quarterly forum, uh, when we talk about the fact that these lower level crimes are not being taken to the jail, this was this was an initiative put together by the CJCC. Uh, and and I know our the, the law enforcement folks you're looking at right there, it's not easy to get that many agencies on the same page to agree uh, on something like that, Sheriff. I mean, that's, that's a big undertaking to get everybody on the same page to say, 
listen, this crime or this uh, violation, we don't need to take that person to jail. You know, Brad, it's, it's, it, it is an undertaking that uh, has been a great effort, a collaborative effort with the, the groups here, but it's necessary. We, we have to have it to move forward and it's just a smart thing to do. We all want the same thing. We want, want safer communities. We want people to be safe in the community. So, uh, and we're, we're all working towards that. Is there an end game when you're talking about this backlog, Solicitor Wilson? Uh, it, because we were talking yesterday uh, off camera. It's, it's what is considered backlog and what, consider, what is considered something that's taking too long or long so, and longer than normal. One of the things that I've been preaching about for years is data and getting the resources to match the need. And I think the, the studies that I'm undertaking in my office and the crunching numbers that we're doing can give a more realistic look of how long it takes to move a case. For example, um, it's nice to say, okay, you should move 80% um, of your caseload within a year. Okay, what does it take to do that? How much court time does it take to do that? And we have to have that match. We have to have court time commiserate with caseload. So what I need in Charleston may be different than what I need in Berkeley. And it's surely going to be different than what they need in union. And we've statewide have got to use data to figure these things out, to figure out how judges are rotated, to figure out what, what judges are assigned where and for how long. And I think long term, you know, obviously COVID is not a Charleston County issue. We're going to have to look at that across the state. We're going to have to triage across the state for court time. And then we're really going to have to prioritize. We cannot, we cannot try cases chronologically. We have to try them by their impact on the community and what cases give us the um, most benefit, whether it's community safety or, for example, if you have a defendant who has committed multiple crimes and taken there that case, taking care of that defendant's case might take care of a whole host of pending offenses. We got to look at things like that or taking a case uh, where a crime has been committed that has multiple co-defendants. If you move that one event, you know, that one crime that's committed, you might move five defendants cases and multiple, multiple warrants. We have to look at all of those things instead of feeding it into a machine and having a docket printed out. And I think, I think that we're all ready to do that. I hope that the court's ready to do it with us. Uh, because we're going to have some serious work to do. On our part, what we have to do is weigh the community's interest in seeing a prosecution through, getting input from the community, getting input from law enforcement, getting input from victims, and realizing that there are certain cases that long term in this situation we just can't go forward with. And we've seen this sort of thing happen after hurricanes and after major events in other places. This has to happen in order, in order for the system to rebuild and rejuvenate. So we're looking at that. We're studying the data to see which cases we can safely do that with. I'm not talking about just throwing away a bunch of cases by any stretch, especially cases that involve victims. But we are going to be looking to see which ones um, have the most impact on the community and seeing that we can resolve those one way or the other quicker. The CJCC has done um, a lot of work, but Jason, how has COVID impacted the work of the CJCC? And what are some of the things uh, that this group is gonna be doing moving forward? Well, I mean, obviously it, it slowed us down a little bit. I think we're still moving forward in the right direction. Like my solicitor Wilson was just mentioning, you know, the, the, the pandemic isn't what caused us to start looking into different options with site and release. We were already doing those things here in Charleston. Um, she was already starting to look more strategic at how we take cases forward. Um, we may have a little more refined focus now and what we're trying to accomplish and, and maybe, you know, try to have that bigger impact on the community quicker than, than we, when we were planning. Um, but you know that that's what's that's what's happened with the, the COVID. It kind of brought to brought to light a lot of the things that we were already working on, 
if you remember way back to, to late March, early April, there were a lot of um, criminal justice systems around the state that were up in arms and people being questioned about why was this happening this way? And, and quite frankly, we kind of looked at that in Charleston and we're like, why, why aren't we having the same up in arms? And, and it was a lot of the things that we had done as part of the CJCC to make sure we're following the bond guidelines and the, and the bail guidelines and to make sure we're putting in diversions and site and release. So those things kind of were, were some, some highlights of CJCC as, as a part of COVID that got highly highlighted and brought to the forefront where we weren't having to scramble and figure out how do we start doing uh, site and release and those types of things? How does the solicitor's office start looking at things in a more strategic manner? And how do they handle things that's in the jail? All that kind of stuff just kind of pushed us and kept us moving forward in the right direction there. Um, but as, as far as what we're continuing to do, you know, we're still actively advancing on all of our strategic uh, initiatives. You can check those out at cjcc.charlestoncounty.org. Throw a link in there for everybody. Um, that's part of our strategic plan. Um, collectively, the strategic plan uh, initiatives serve to engage the community in, in improving the local CJ system and, ad and addressing inequities, strengthening jail diversions and deflections and uh, from the criminal justice system. And they focus on fairness and reentry and achieve advancements in case processing. Um, the plan was built upon the results of our dialogues that we had last, well, I guess it wasn't last year, in 2019, the change uh, effort where we engaged over 1,200 uh, citizens in a, in a setting. Um, we also found a great deal of efficiency in meeting virtually this year. Um, we probably had more regular attendance to our, our monthly meetings and these forums certainly, I don't know how many we have right off the top, let's see here over 50 here that'd be a, a great or an excellent showing if we'd have been in a in an actual uh, brick and mortar building having a, a meeting like this so certainly we're seeing uh easier to communicate um maybe not the way we always want to communicate but it certainly does facilitate a different uh avenue there for us to to uh to keep working through so um we're also looking forward to this all being over so we can get back into more of the community engagement the in-person stuff, the hanging out and, and getting to see each other and, and catch up with one another. Um, and, and certainly make sure everybody come out to our next uh, quarterly forum. We, we kind of decide and, and base our input on what these forums are going to be about when the based off the community's input and what they, they want to hear about and what we need to work on and, uh, and go from there. So there will be a survey at the conclusion of this event for everybody that registered. Please make sure you give us your feedback so we can we can listen to your concerns and make sure we're addressing those along the way. And, and Brad, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. Um, we are hiring right now. The CJCC is hiring an IT system specialist. So if you uh, that, that posting is on the Charleston County website. So if you want to see how you can get involved and make a difference with our team here, go check that out and uh, and consider applying for that that event there or that. Uh, that, that job there so I have to take advantage of the shameless plug time that was all right no you did it you nailed it uh we're going to start our uh, our question and answer session here if you have any questions uh you can put them into the uh q a box there um and we can uh get some of these questions answered for you we'll start with uh robert morris uh the, do you plan on keeping the new healthcare provider at the jail uh, they just, uh, they want to know if that's, uh, uh, something that's going to stick around. So Path is actually a, a new provider at the jail and they, uh, they have just renewed their contract. So what they're sticking around. Uh, Jamila Frazier, are there any specific mechanisms in place to track the data to reduce the disparities in sentencing? for various groups, uh, particularly African-American, and are those mechanisms used to decrease the disparities? I can speak to that in some ways. Uh, I've set out to collect data for my office, and I'm one of the few prosecutors in the country who's doing this kind of work. What's unique about what my office is doing is we aren't just tracking what sentence someone got because there are many factors into what goes into a sentence. What we're tracking uh, and, and what's unusual is we're tracking what our recommendation was. 
and we are setting out to determine first whether or not we're making the same plea offers, uh, the same sentence recommendations to black people, to white people, to Hispanic people who are similarly situated. Uh, that has been quite an undertaking to um, get that data entered. And now we're undertaking the analysis portion. The incarceration part, again, goes more to what a judge did and may um, be more dictated by what the charges were initially. But part and parcel of what I'm study, studying will be um, the, the incarceration disparity. Um, I can affect my one part of it and I can shine light on the other parts as in the number of cases that come into my office disproportionately from law enforcement. Um, I can control what we do and then it's sort of out of our hands, but we have set out to study this data, um, to be open and transparent about the analysis when we get it. I'm working with um, independent folks um, as part of the MacArthur Foundation, Loyola at Chicago, and then apart from MacArthur, um, Georgetown University. So 2021 should be a very enlightening year to see what's going on here in Charleston and Berkeley counties. And that's, you know, tying back to one of the things Jason was saying about the CJCC and what we've been doing for so long. Many times when I see pundits and politicians and talking heads talking about our system, it's like they're talking about some other state or some other place in the country. Yes, we have work to do. We have miles to go. But we also have groups who are willing to roll up our sleeves and take a good look at our own um, operations and make those changes. And so a lot of these things um, that other places are struggling with, we already had that struggle. Now we're in the, the, the reform part. We're in the really making the changes from what we've learned. And I see that the same way within my office, just on Ms. Uh, Frazier's question. Um, we're collecting the data. Now I've gotten the folks who have the talent, the ability, the know-how, because I sure don't, to analyze it, to control for different things like prior criminal history. And then to give us something meaningful, not based on what's happening in Portland or in Philadelphia, but what's happening right here in Charleston and Berkeley. And, um, and we are here to shine a light on it, to take responsibility and to make changes where we need them. But it all will be public and um, it will be insightful, I have no doubt. And just maybe to jump in on the, the front end of the CJ system from the law enforcement side, I'm sure most people know that the, the police department, we've done a racial bias audit here and working with other groups and bringing that, that feedback into CJCC as well. Um, but like Solicitor Wilson mentioned, once you get the information, now you got to figure out how to, where the problem is and then how to fix it and try not to make it worse along the way. And, uh, you know, so we, I think we all try to, especially in CJCC, try to focus on, you know, to, limiting that harm to the community, trying to do the best we can to make the community better as we move through this process to, to you know, first gather data in a lot of cases and then analyze the data and then say, okay, well, this looks like it might be here. Let's try to tweak this here. Make, let's, oh, but that might've made it better and let's keep doing it that way or it might've made it worse and we need to fix it and go back the way we were and kind of kind of move it there. So, um, you know, it, 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 is, it is a lot of work and, you know, I think we're all collectively moving in, in the right direction there, but it is a lot of work to, to sometimes just even collect this data, but then to get it analyzed and then figure out what's causing it there. And that's really, you know, where the holistic approach to CJCC comes from, because we have, you know, everything from reentry to to houselessness and those types of things being addressed in these discussions. So I think it's very, very positive there to start addressing these things in that forum. Let's see any other questions. If you want to uh, raise your hand, we can uh, call on you that way as well. Um, Jason, what are some of the other key initiatives moving forward? Um, well, we don't have time to talk. Well, I don't have time to talk about them all, and y'all don't want to hear me drone about them all. But 
Um, we're starting to dig deeper into what can be done um, for the small percentage of folks that are, are keeping people or getting people into trouble and uh, and moving forward with that, you know, trying to find some of the other options that we can implement um, between a bond hearing and bringing a case to, to justice that will help with public safety and getting folks to court. We're looking at our familiar faces um, case conferencing to work more closely with the, the most active familiar faces that really need more of a public health response than a criminal justice response. Um, starting small with that so we can build the systems and procedures we'd like to to take such efforts to scale those over time. And lastly, we're actively studying the growing backlog in the CJ or in the GS cases, the General Sessions cases, and, and trying to figure out a strategic way to work with the solicitor and all of us together on how to mitigate those as, as we're moving forward. Sylvia Judy typed in a question here, uh, and I'll just put this one, anybody wants to take it. Uh, what, uh, what improvements can we expect on community outreach in Charleston County, specifically community crime watch programs? Sheriff Graziano, you wanna take that? Sure, so uh, just this week, we, we are rolling out as of Friday, um, a new community, en community engagement unit. Um, it, it's actually a whole bureau focused on community engagement. And uh, that entails uh, going out into the community, not just actively doing recruiting from the, the communities, but being being involved in those communities. I had a uh, a, a nice meeting today with uh, some folks on the on the outside of, of Charleston, uh, in Charleston County, but towards Edisto, Ravenel, Hollywood, and there's a rec league that they're starting uh, in, in that area. They they have 145 acres and they have no idea what to do with it, and they want. Uh, you know, they want to partner with law enforcement and other folks to help figure out how to get these recreation programs out to the rural areas. Uh, again, Jason said it earlier, transportation is always an issue, but they're, we're working through that. They've, uh, they've, they've got a $1.8 million grant that they're working with to, to, you know, help do some of that. So those are just exciting things that, uh, you know, ba basically getting back into our community, which we kind of haven't done uh, in a way that, and working on our staffing, we're we're 20. I'll throw my my plug in there. We're 24 bodies short on the law side and 104 positions short on the detention side. So we need people too. And in order to get uh, folks in the community, we need to fill these positions so we can put people in the community that look like the community. And that that's one of the most exciting initiatives I think that we're we're working on. Sure. Uh, I guess, Jason, I'm going back to you. What's, what's the dialogue to change? So the, the dialogue to change brings people and institutions together using an equity, equity lens to connect across differences, share honestly, can consider diverse views and work together to identify and offer actions toward change. We applied the dialogue to change uh, through expanded community engagement to better inform and involve the community and improving the local criminal justice system, system which helped shape our strategic plan. Uh, we heard from the community, particularly those that were most impacted, um, that, you know, to raise an awareness of critical challenges and, and brought up the community together to help us find solutions with there. So they really helped us be a conduit to the community, help us be better informed and better in tune there and kind of give us some guidance along, you know, working with uh, some of these groups that we've been in contact with. This thing's not being in person to do these, but uh, there is another event coming up in April, right? Yep. The next one is uh, Tuesday, April 6th. We're still uh, working on the agenda for that one. So if you've got any feedback, again, make sure to, to, to give us some, some thoughts and comments in your survey here that you'll get at the end of the uh, tonight's event. So somebody sitting at home and they've, they've, they've taken a keen interest to this tonight. Uh, how do they get involved? Yeah, so the first thing, just go to cjcc.charlestoncounty.org. Um, you can sign up for the newsletter there. You can get a, follow our social media. They're, we're on just about all the platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we have a regular publication that's posted to the, uh, uh, the, the webpage there. You can, like I said, sign up for the different email notifications. Um, just talk to other people ab about it. You know, there's a lot of community people, uh, com community representatives and people involved with this that are more than happy to start talking about it with you. And you, you might end up 
down a rabbit hole with them talking about all kinds of stuff or, or stuck in a meeting that you thought was 10 minutes and turned into an hour, but that's just how passionate a lot of these people are about it. Um, our meetings are virtual right now, so they're easier to, to attend. So once you get signed up there, you can certainly join and get notified about our monthly meetings and, and listen in and participate with those. Or just, uh, you know, just about every police department uh, is taking volunteers to help out with the different things that are going on and looking for community feedback. So just reach out to your local law enforcement, whether that's us, the sheriff, Mount Pleasant, or Charleston, even Sullivan's Island, Isle of Palms. I'm sure they'd appreciate, you know, hearing from the community um, that, they, that they're serving there, how they want to be. Uh, policed and, and the criminal justice system to work there. So just just getting involved and looking for somebody to uh, to interact with there is going to be the, the best best way to get involved. So and of course come to our our next forum on uh, April sixth will be our next one. So any other closing remarks from the panel? Brad, I, I want to just say we started out talking about COVID, so I'll finish talking about COVID. You know we're moving from the fear of COVID now to the fear of vaccinations. And we really need to get folks to get vaccinated. I got mine today. It's the same as a flu shot, guys. It didn't hurt. I promise you, I'm still here. I'm healthy. Uh, Scarlet's next. We need to do it public, especially public officials, um, to, to build build that trust that people get it. I know it's the only the only cases you hear about are the ones that people have bad reactions. And I'm I'm here to tell you, I saw a lot of people getting their vaccinations today, and I saw nothing. Uh, no, no adverse reactions. So please, 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 when it's your time to get your vaccination, uh, consider doing that. That That's a great point, Sheriff. And I tell you, I got so emotional when I got word from my mother that she had gotten the call that she was in line. And I, I sent her a text and said, I, I cannot wait for a hug a few months from now. I encourage people to, I can't wait for mine. I, I'm ready. I'm a hugger when she gets hers. <laughs> and I'll just take the risk, but um, yeah, we got to get people vaccinated. We really do. Folks over at the uh, detention center, any uh, final words? We're all happy to be here together and the collaboration that we've had. You know, WellPath came on board recently and we've enjoyed working with uh, Major Harris and Graziana and her team. You know, I think that the, the collaboration is the, the, the key right now. You know, when Major Harris and I started, we have adopted our plan over and over, and every situation is different. There's not one thing that is like um, day in and day out with every patient case, and that's the same across any situation that we've got going on. So I think it's really exciting right now in the community that we pull together and through this COVID pandemic versus dividing, um, because together we can get through this and we can meet the needs of everybody in our community. Else, I think we've done a fabulous job here and uh, we've got a great team and great support system. Our patients really appreciate the, the high quality care they're getting here. So it's a really a privilege to work with such a fine group of individuals. So I just wanted to say that I, I think that without our medical department, we would not be as, we would not have such low numbers without COVID. Whenever we have someone come in, they are always on the spot. They're really ready to go out and um, and make sure that they test the whoever needs to be tested. And then they monitor them for 14, 10 to 14 days. So that's been a plus for, the, um, for our resident population as well. But then it also lets the staff know that we have somebody um, on hand that's not only willing to help with our residents, but they were also willing to help with us. So the collaboration has been great. All right, Major Harris, thank you. Sheriff, solicitor, Jason, uh, for the folks over there at the detention center. Jason, you got any final words? Yeah, the only thing I'll just kind of close out with is, you know, just reminding everybody to get involved. We, we've, we've seen a lot on the news about people wanting to get involved with stuff that CJC has been working on and uh, get involved with CJCC and just, you know, a, a big thank you to Everybody that's been a part of CJCC, not only for continuing to contribute and moving forward all of our strategic plans and goals and moving forward those, but staying at work and, and getting our jobs done along the way that hasn't been easy and certainly isn't continuing to be easy, but just thank you to everybody out there that, that's been working in the criminal justice system, not only since March, but you know forever here and, and, and working on the CJCC to move us forward in the right direction. 
All right, very cool. For the panel, I want to say thank you for joining us here tonight. If you join late uh, and you want to watch this again, it'll be up on the CJCC's website. You can watch that and the first forum as well. Until next time, thank you again for being here. Make it a great night. Thank you, Brett.